my friends, my name is Sweet Nation, and this is episode two of Nostalgic Reviews. And one film we're going to be looking at will be Amazing Grace. Now, if none of you know what this film is, um, again, I probably wouldn't blame you, but there are a number of familiar actors in the film that you might recognize. For example, um, let's see. Uh, like, um, Eon Drifford. Oh, I'm pronouncing that right. Um, he's the actor, if you... If you've ever seen any of the Fantastic Four films, particularly from uh, 2004 and 2007, I think. Uh, Fantastic Four and Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer. He is the actor who portrays uh, Mr. Fantastic in those films. Uh, we also got uh, Sayaron Hines. Um... For any of you who don't know who he is, he's the one who uh, does the voice of uh, Steppenwolf in the and both versions of Justice League, both the one from 2017 as well as uh, Zack Snyder's recently released Justice League film, which I still have yet to do see because you know I don't own HBO Max. Uh. Uh, but I mostly know him from this film as well as uh, the uh, first season of uh, the uh, historical supernatural horror f series called uh, The Terror from AMC. Uh, let's see. Oh, and it also has a Benedict Cumberbatch as well. So, um... Unfortunately, his name is not exactly on the uh, movie case. Oh, boy. Uh, this film was directed by uh, Michael Apted, who, um, who um, unfortunately uh, recently passed away at the age of 71. Uh, well... Sad. Very sad. Now, you might be wondering, what exactly is this movie? Well, it's a historical film, in a way. <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> it's okay. It's okay, I don't have COVID, if anybody is concerned. It's basically a historical film about uh, the end of the British slave trade. It uh, takes place between the years uh, 1782 and seven, no, 1807, but sometimes, I mean, sometimes it can be a little confusing as to uh, what point in time this actually takes place because it jumps like all over the place. There's a main narration that takes place for at least about two-thirds of the way into the film that solely takes place in the year 1797 and basically tells the first 15 years in like um, either like in flashbacks or over narration and then afterward and then when it gets to the last 10 years that the film focuses on and like the last third of the film, it, um, it, it kind of keeps it pretty consistent. Though, though, even though it does jump around a bit when it comes to the timeline, it, it's surprisingly, uh, it's much more easier to follow than the way that Dunkirk did it. And that is a legitimate criticism of the film Dunkirk because Dunkirk, the way Dunkirk did his whole time, what time span thing. I mean, I mean, it like 
it was just so confusing to watch. And I know Christopher Nolan made that film and 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 I think he did a fantastic job of The Dark Knight, which is unfortunately the only film I've actually seen in the Dark Knight trilogy. I love that film, but seriously. <sighs> But seriously, dude, whatever you did with Dunkirk was so confusing. Thankfully, that doesn't happen in this film. Pretty much keeps it kind of easy to follow. You can kind of, you can kind of uh, get the idea of whether this takes place in the past sort of thing, or whether it's sort of a present sort of thing, or or you can clearly tell it takes place after the whole part that is done through a narration. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so you might be wondering, well, if this follows the actions that led to the end of the British slave trade, uh, who does the film focus on specifically? Well, it takes, it mostly centers around one certain character, but I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't like show it in like a sort of way like this character is like the only person who, who should be given credit for the end of the British slave trade, unlike, you know, like some movies probably from like 50 or 60 years ago would have probably done it. Uh, the film mostly focuses on, uh, one character, uh, that character being, uh, William Wilberforce. Now, and, um, uh, for anyone who's actually studied William Wilberforce and his contributions to ending the British slave trade, yeah, this is basically a story about him, but that's not to say that other characters get their, their, parts into the um <clears throat> ending the British slave trade like like for example uh like like Rufus Sewell's character to Thomas Clarkson who was basically uh, probably just as equally um influential into bringing down the British slave trade just as much as William Wilberforce is uh we all and um while while this character doesn't necessarily have a, an important part in ending the British slave trade, it does it does she does present a bit of a uh giving Wilberforce the a bit of a grit to keep keep the fight going because because at some point in the film because at a point in the film he kind of comes to this certain low point like like it's pointless to keep fighting but she impresses him on to keep fighting and that's his and that's his future wife Barbara Ann Spooner <laughs> and another person who motivates Wilberforce at the beginning needing to take on the British slave trade is his former minister uh John Newton who as you may know, who, if you don't know, he's the one who pens the song Amazing Grace, which the film is promptly named after. Uh, I gotta say, um, the acting in this film was pretty amazing. Interesting, to say the least. I mean, the fact that, I mean, most I mean, if you see films like, uh, say, uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes with, like, uh, Robert Downey Jr. or, or films that have, like, the, where they have, like, an American actor portraying, uh, like, a British character, I mean, I mean, from what I've seen, I mean, it's kind of, uh, easy, it seems to be a lot more easier to have an, a British actor portraying an American character as opposed to having an American actor portraying a British character with the exception of Robert Downey Jr. because to be honest I mean his British accent is so convincing I, I honestly thought for a while there that he was actually from England originally I mean it didn't last long thank goodness but in this film there's none of that they they just hire Actors from 
from merely the UK. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, every one of these people were born in the UK, and, and it doesn't matter if they were born in, you know, like England or Wales or, or, or Scotland or maybe Northern Ireland. Lynn, they're in the UK, they're going to be, if they were born in the, in the country and the places that make up the UK, they're going to be in this film. Now, um, you might be wondering, so how deep does it go into this whole, uh, slave trade thing? Well, I mean, it, it doesn't convey it, like, uh, visually, like you would say in a film like, uh, Amistad from, by Steven Spielberg. <laughs> uh, it kind of gives it a bit of a... It kind of explains it through a verbal explanation. Though there are, though there is a bit of point where we see like, where Wilberforce has a dream after reading a letter there from one of his uh, abolitionist friends who, who traveled to Jamaica and reported what he witnessed there with with how the slaves were being treated, inhumanely, I might add. And, and basically the whole thing is like, I mean, you don't see Wilberforce reading the whole thing. You actually see it being spoke, being like playing out in his dream and, and a voiceover being voiceover Re basically reading what was in the letter and it's all done through a dream I mean Wilberforce himself I mean I mean I mean literally in the film that happens he wakes up he's woken up by his cousin Henry and he explains I was reading James letter from Jamaica and when I fell asleep it's like I was living inside it or something like that and then there are at least two points where you see them show a slave ship now they don't they don't they don't have any i mean there's only like two people who actually go into the ship that's Wilberforce and uh and another influential character to the bringing down of the uh slave trade through his uh experiences on board a slave ship, especially since the fact that this particular man is a former slave, freed, <laughs> and becomes an int and actually is able to write an autobiography about his experiences. And uh, by the way, th uh, in, in the case any of you are wondering, no, this character is not a fictional character. He is a real. He's a real person. Actually lived. Really did experience. In slavery, if he was subjected to it, was freed and did write an autobiography about his experiences as a slave, how he was kidnapped from Africa, taken to Jamaica, and then, and then just everything. So they get onto the ship. They kind of. And the, and the character, uh, uh, I really hope I'm, I don't want to try to put, mispronounce his name, but, uh, I think it was, uh, Aquiano, I think, it, I think that's what his name, I think that's what his name is. And, um, actually with a few exceptions, I think this is, this is an actual actor who actually comes, who is actually from, a country in Africa, I think. I, I I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure because because when I was watching the behind the scenes stuff, that he did the the accent he was using in the film. 
I could tell he was using that exact same accent in the behind the scenes stuff. So I don't think he was faking the accent. I think that's really how he sounds. <clears throat> kind of interesting if that is actually the deal. <sighs> Um, hmm. I lost track where it was. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. They end up going on the slave ship, and and Equiano shows shows Wilberforce exactly what these slaves experience when they're being transported from from a plate from a, from Africa to Jamaica, and explaining what they do, how they are organized within the ship ship where they where some of the sailors would take take certain women that were captive chain them up to this one thing in order to rape them them given very little given very little food water and that if the and that and even knows how long the journey would take. And it makes me wonder how exactly are they, and given that the ships have like uh, still use sails, I mean, kind of makes sense it would take this long. He basically says that it takes three weeks to get from Africa to Jamaica, though that only depends on if the weather remains good. So, yeah, if if they end up getting like, you know, no wind or get stuck in a storm or something like that, it may take a little longer than three weeks. Maybe an entire month or two. <clears throat> and it kind of shows the sh just how difficult it was for Wilberforce to actually try to get this whole abolition movement and getting rid of the slave trade in. I mean, the fact that it takes this man like 20 years just to end the slave trade in England. I mean, it's just, I mean, you see the struggle. He gets the, I mean, I mean, he gets evidence. He, get, he gets, he gets everything, but these politicians, they just, they just hold on to this whole thing. Like, we cannot survive without the slave trade. I mean, seriously. I mean, seriously. If if you guys could survive, if you guys couldn't have survived without a slave trade, then explain to me how you survived the life for the first, first 600 years since William the Conqueror became the first king of England that, that is actually actually used to, you know, like, do the whole current line of kings and queens that are in England, going from William the First all the way to now. I mean, I mean, William the Conqueror basically conquered England, like, 600, 700 years before, before Wilberforce even suggested this whole thing, and even maybe and even hundreds of years before the a slave trade was even started or even slavery came to england so don't tell me that you guys can't survive without slavery when you did it like hundreds of years before slavery even came to england that's it just shows you how how ignorant these guys are but it also shows how basically they weren't seeing it like, oh, we're racist and everything like that. No, they kind of, some, some of the guys, there was at least one character who did say that slavery was a moral evil and a stain on England, but was also considered kind of uh, downplaying the whole thing mainly because he was kind of seeing it from a financial situation as opposed to merely just the moral status. They, they, he honestly thought 
that if if England got rid of the slave trade tomorrow, like literally the next day, there could be like financial issues throughout all of England. So he merely recommends gradual abolition, slowly getting rid of the slave trade as opposed to getting rid of it the next day. And, 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 and I say... And, and I'm merely talking about the slave trade, because the slave trade is not slavery itself. Even if they got rid of the slave trade, they would, there would still be slaves throughout the entire British Empire. And unfortunately... And unfortunately, um... Wilberforce wasn't able to actually... Remain a member of parliament, because that's what he was. He was a member of parliament who basically was one of the main figures that brought about the end of the slave trade, because he wasn't the only one. There were actually a number of them, including the prime minister of England at the time, William Pitt the Younger, who was um, portrayed by Benedict Cumberbatch in this film. And and while I do love this movie, I did kind of have a, a bit of a problem with it. I mean, it, it, historically speaking, and nothing about the production really bothered me. Nothing about the acting really stood out. It may, it mostly has to do with some of the historical aspects of the film. Like, for example, uh, how the slave trade even ended. Because, because the way they do it is like, is like they suggest they would... Basically, it's basically a tactic where, you know, you know, if you know anything about this point in time, England was kind of having its own quarrels with... France at the time, you know, you know, because during during all that, you know, the French Revolution was happening, Napoleon was coming to power, where they were constantly trying to get at each other's throats, or at least France was trying to get at England's throat, and it was kind of a, it kind of made it a little harder for Wilberforce and his friends to uh, actually try to bring in about the end of the slave trade because of England's constant wars with France. And so, in the film, the way they were able to actually be able to get rid of slavery, or at least the slave trade, I can't say slavery because, I mean, slavery, slavery in England continued for like another 25 years in England after the slave trade was abolished in 1807. But the way they got rid of the slave trade, or at least according to the film, is that basically they made an anti-slavery bill that apparently is also an anti-French bill, which is basically, which the whole concept is that, is, is that there were, that slave ships were bringing in their, their Cargo, as they would call it, if you could even consider human life cargo. It would basically bring them in to in from Jamaica to England, basically use using a neutral American flag, which, which I find a little awkward because they're using the American flag that has the Union Jack and the square, not not any other stars and. By 1807 and by the 1800s, which this is being proposed during, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure the U.S. was using using the the one with the 15 stars and the 15 stripes. I could be wrong, but I think that's the flag they would be using for. I don't think they would be using the American flag that had the Union Jack in it as well. <clears throat> and basically it says if if a ship comes in using the neutral American flag that they would be considered contraband meaning 
that they could be and that mainly because they because these ships are doing it doing it not just with england but they're also doing it with france spain and whatever french as well as the dutch because at the time napoleon actually appointed his brother two of his brothers to oversee spain and and the netherlands during his time as the french emperor and these ships were constantly were doing this not just with england but also with them under the neutral american flag so uh, so so they couldn't exactly know whether or not these were actually sh actually french ships or or some or what they were neutral neutral ships that were just going about so they just Actually, now, I, now that I think about it, I think I'm starting to get an idea on how the War of 1812 actually started. I think this film is actually implying that William Wilberforce started the War of 1812. Because because this whole thing where British ships would, would actually end up going... Going on to American ships, ships while they were sailing f <coughs> across the Atlantic. <coughs> and would take them... Back to England as contraband. I'm pretty sure th because that stuff actually happened, and that's one of the few things that actually started the War of 1812. <laughs> so I think this film is actually implying that William Wilberforce actually started that stuff. But in reality, uh, that's I I'm not going to pretend like that never happened. But that wasn't the one thing that brought about the end of the British slave trade. What brought about the end of the British slave trade was a bit of a change of tactics, actually. See, and and when Wilberforce was trying to get this whole thing passed through Parliament, he was doing it from, like, the trying to get it passed through the House of Commons and then the House of Lords. Many times it would not pass the House of Commons, but if it ever did pass the House of Commons, it still faced the House of Lords, and it always got rejected. So, so, William Wilber, no, William Pitt's replacement, because he, he, he died in 1806, while still Prime Minister, and his replacement, Lord Granfield, Granville, Granville, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, so, actually suggested a different tactic, Pass it through the House of Lords first, then pass it through the House of Commons. And that worked. And that's how the British slave trade ended. Oh, and a minor, oh, and also a uh, uh, bit of a smaller little thing. Uh, the character, the character of uh, Charles, Lord Charles Fox, yeah, um... At the end of the film, you see him there at the, uh, when, uh, the vote is made and, uh, the slave trade is brought to an end throughout the entire British Empire. Yeah, um, Fox actually never lived that long. He actually died the year before. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's about it so yeah if uh, if you're one of those people who are uh, just interested in how these whole things came to an end you know like uh, the end of the British slave trade or or maybe even or maybe even just any country ending their acts, ending these slave, pro-slavery movements, then I would suggest um, the Amazing Grace is definitely one of them. And it, it, and to also expand that, uh, if you want, I I and another film I would highly recommend is uh, the Steven Spielberg film titled Lincoln because. 
because what's actually interesting is that without William Wilberforce's his contributions to ending the British slave trade, and well as uh, trying to bring down the end of the British slave trade, which I mean he did live long enough to see just he was no longer a member of parliament at the time and sadly ended up dying three days after slavery and throughout the entire British Empire was abolished in the year um, 1833. His life and experience actually inspired one of the greatest contributions to the end of American slavery. That man was Abraham Lincoln. So, if you want, you can give it a check. Check. Maybe you can possibly maybe rent it on uh, YouTube or or maybe maybe Netflix. Hopefully, I don't know. So yeah. Uh, and I mostly did this because um, a historical film is always something that intrigues me. Plus, like I said, the director Michael Apton. Apted, 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 not Apton, uh, did recently pass away at the age of 71, so I felt like I should thank him for actually making this film. It really inspired me. And tune in next time, I will be doing another How I Should Have Done It episode, and, um, um, Stay tuned.